Okay, uh, so let's get this going. So welcome to another statistics seminar. Today we have like a Patel from Sandia National Laboratories giving a talk. Um, and I'll introduce you, so I'll read out your blurb if that's okay. Sure. Uh, so like Patel is a senior statistician in the Center of Computing Research at Sandia National Laboratories. After obtaining a bachelor's in mathematics, she completed her PhD in statistics from Imperial College London in 2019 on the modeling and inference of spatial temporal processes for biological imaging. Currently, her research interests broadly lie in fields of statistical computing, simulation-based statistical learning of stochastic processes, and Bayesian non-parametrics. Applications of her work include uh, bioinformatics, cybersecurity, climatology, and the social sciences. Uh, all right, uh, so a few things about the seminar, just if you have a question, please raise your hand. And once the speaker calls on you, feel free to ask your question. Same thing for people on Zoom. Um, yes, please follow the same thing. The talk is about 45, 50 sure. minutes. And then hopefully I'll, I can I'll keep you, within that time. Yeah, I'll let yeah. you know when it's five minutes before. Okay, you. sounds good. All right, so let's welcome my <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Lekka. I'm a statistician at Sandia National Labs. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, flexible force process models um, with applications. Um, so I'm going to give like a very short introduction to point processes um, and really kind of delve into the idea of self-excitation um, through Hawks processes. Um, I'll then give two examples the flexible Hawks processes, uh, the first one uh, with binned or approximate data in space and time, uh, and the second with flexible excitation kernels. Um, I'll then give some conclusions and some references. Um, just an introduction uh, to point processes. Um, we have some probability space, um, and we usually deal with simple finite point processes, uh, X on curly X, which is a subset of R to the D. Um, and this is a measurable mapping from a sample space uh, to the space of finite subsets of curly X. Um, and this representation is nice because for any subset of curly X, um, it's the counting measure NX uh, counts the number of points in that subset uh, through the integral of the point process. Um, and while this is kind of quite abstract, um, intuitively, this means that any probability distribution um, P of our point process X uh, can be written as the probability measure of its pre-image uh, in omega. Um, so typically, uh, point processes are defined by their intensity functions. Um, so I'm going to call it lambda X here for uh, just a general point process X. Um, and the intensity function is really nice because uh, the integral of it uh, measures the expected number of events um, in a subset uh, A um, of curly X. Um, so the example I'm going to try and give throughout this talk is when curly X is um, in R to the D cross T, so in space and time, um, where T is a non-negative uh, real numbers. Um, and so if we think about the spatial temporal point process X on curly X, um, its intensity function satisfies this kind of crazy limit here, um, which intuitively means um, the um, infinitesimal rate um, of events uh, that are expected to occur at a uh, point S in space and at time T, and absorb that into this um, X variable here. Um, and in the general case, this expectation and um, generally a lot of the intensity functions uh, are actually conditional on um, the history of that process. So all events um, that have occurred in the history up until uh, time t. Um, so just to talk a little bit about self-exciting behavior. Um, so self-excitation is a special type of stochastic behavior um, that we're gonna represent um, with a special type of uh, stochastic process called the Hawkes process. And um, here uh, with this intensity function, um, X is dependent on its past value. So the, the incorporation of, a his, of this history or the filter, filtration is really important um, when characterizing self-excitation or self-exciting point processes. Um, and it really gives rise uh, into the insight of internal dynamics of uh, a general uh, process. So self-excitation is relevant um, to many kind of real world phenomena um, and is used a lot um, in modeling. So for example, earthquake modeling, um, when we have earthquake events that then spur on um, a number of diff or a number of more earthquake events, financial markets, uh, social networks, as an example I gave of a launch, um, uh, when you kind of post something on social media and that kind of um, impulses a number of uh, posts afterwards. So all of this can be uh, modeled really nicely with uh, Hawks processes. 
So Hawke's processes are a special class of uh, self-exciting processes, um, and they are characterized by their conditional intensity function, which is just the um, our characterization of a point process. Um, and so given the example of curly X, so we're looking in space and time here, um, we define events as kind of a spatial and temporal marks. Um, the um, conditional intensity function uh, follows um, this guy here. So we have a background intensity here, and then we have a triggering or an excitation kernel here, um, which gives the dependence of the process on the history um, of uh, its past events. Um, so here, the background intensity um, gives kind of background uh, events um, and the rates of events happening in the background. Um, and the excitation function here will give um, the impact of previous events on new events happening. So any event that comes from a Hawks process either comes from a background with this right here or is generated by a previous event, event in its history um, through that kernel there. Um, and so usually kernels include um, the exponential. So we have an exponential decay um, or power law decays, um, which are pr uh, pretty um, nice, especially in earthquake modeling. So um, how do we infer parameters of the intensity function that characterizes our uh, point process? So um, given a Hawks process uh, with a known structure, so we know the forms of the background um, and the excitation kernels, uh, or we know the functional forms, um, we can infer parameters of these intensities um, with the log likelihood function here, that's given by this guy here. Um, and so for models that can exactly kind of measure or um, have the data in space and time or space or time, um, typical approaches for parameter estimation just include um, maximum likelihood approaches uh, or Monte Carlo Bayesian approaches, um, especially for kind of non-constant uh, background uh, intensities. So a uh, key example here that I'll give, um, and this is something that a colleague of mine at Sandia was has been working on very recently, um, is studying um, the spatial kind of temporal trends of lightning strikes, um, both in space and in time. And what he found was that uh, lightning strikes have this self-excitation behavior. Um, so the existence of one lightning strike in space and time um, will lead to more lightning strikes um, in close kind of proximity in time and in space. Um, so this is a, just a non-parametric kind of um, modeling of, here, of the Hawks process that he's applied to lightning strikes um, under this model here. So we have a constant background rate um, and we have a separable um, excitation kernel, um, which means that the time and space excitations are separated and we can take the product of them to give our space time kernel. Um, so the excitation kernel time is just this exponential decay. Uh, and in space is kind of uh, this Gaussian type uh, distribution here. And so what this means is that uh, if I have a lightning strike that comes from a background point, it's likely to trigger another lightning strike uh, within an exponential amount of time um, and within a 2D kind of Gaussian ball around it. So what are some of the challenges um, with uh, applying Hall's processes and maybe some of the challenges with data? So for many applications, it's not actually clear how we parameterize both the background and the triggering kernels, um, especially for kind of a very complex data sets um, where we don't know um, where the background uh, uh, events come from or how they are self-excited. So typically what happens is people use a constant background um, with a predefined uh, excitation kernel, usually like uh, the exponential decay. Um, but we've seen in many applications that this is not flexible enough for kind of you know, large spatial temporal data sets that really exhibit different levels of self-excitation at different spatial and temporal scales. Um, another key difficulty with uh, event data is that we don't really have the time or the space stamps at, um, exactly. And this is true, um, especially in real-time applications such as global sensing data, um, such as the, the lightning strike data. So in global sensing data, typically events are in space are approximated to the nearest latitude, longitude, degree. Um, and then also approximated to the nearest hour or 15 minute interval. So we really don't see exactly where the events occur in continuous time and space, which is um, generally what process models are, are, are useful. So in this talk, we're going to define a flexible Hawks process um, as one that can handle uh, nuances um, with kind of flexible background and triggering functions or a mechanism to deal with kind of approximate data uh, that's observed discreetly or in intervals. Um, so the first part, I'm going to talk about bin data. 
So here, binning refers to the rounding of event locations um, and counting the number of events that happen in that interval. So if we just take uh, our state space to be in time, so we're kind of removing the, the spatial element here, um, we just bin the number of events according to some pre-specified time interval length. Um, and what we observe are not the uh, event times, but the number of events that occur in each bin. Um, so instead of seeing the, um, the timestamps of all of these events, all we know is that in bin one, we receive zero events, and bin two, we receive three events, and so on. And so when aggregating this data, um, we're losing information of the underlying horse process structure, um, especially with the self-excitation, because, because we don't see exactly when the time uh, stamps occur, and we really don't know um, how we can infer things like self-excitation or the underlying characteristics of that. So here's a working example. So again, we're just considering our state space over time. Um, uh, just a general kind of intensity function, which is really popular in a lot of uh, in a lot of frameworks. So we have a constant uh, background rate um, and an exponential decay uh, for the excitation or the triggering kernel. Um, and the quantities of interest are, are like estimating new alpha and beta. So our observed data are the event counts per time step. Uh, so we have uh, our vector of uh, counts uh, in each bin. Um, and so if we knew where the timestamps occurred, so I'll call this latent data uh, T. Um, if we knew where, uh, our timestamps, we could just use uh, maximum likelihood approaches to be able to kind of find new alpha and beta. But here we don't, we just see our count vector. Um, and so um, I'm gonna just keep this latent da data T in case we wanna use it um, in some kind of conditional model. And so what we want to use, what we want to do is estimate theta. So that's new alpha beta from N here. So what are the current methods for parameter, uh, parameter estimation of bin data um, with a Hawks kernel? Um, so when we did our literature search, we found two key methods um, which we noted. So the first one was approximating a Hawks process as an integer valued uh, autoregressive process uh, where we can kind of uh, find the distribution of the bin counts um, through the through this model um, and kind of construct a non-parametric estimator um, through conditional least squares, and that's for the triggering kernel. The second, which is a lot more simple, I guess, is uh, just building a log likelihood through a piecewise constant intensity function. So if you think about your bins, um, over each bin, we just have a constant intensity that has kind of jumps at the end of the bins, so it's stepwise. Um, and of course, this provides an oversimplified approximation of what, what's going on in the Hawks process, uh, because we don't really get to see a lot of this self-excitation uh, when we have piecewise constant um, intensities. So if we knew um, our timestamps, our latent variable T, um, what we try initially tried to do was just uh, use expectation maximization with our latent data T that we don't know. So um, for, for a lot of you, maybe you know what EM is, but I'm just going to go through it very briefly. Um, this is an iterative frequentist method um, that can compute um, a quasi maximum likelihood estimate of our unknown parameters in theta um, by kind of iterating between an expectation step and a maximization step uh, conditional on this on these latent variables T um, given the observed data. So, so using this kind of iterative approach, we can um, iterate over um, quasi maximum likelihood estimates until we, we converge uh, in our parameters. So in this problem, uh, our expectation step computes this Q function here um, of uh, the expected value of the log posterior of our unknown, uh, unknown values theta um, with respect to this conditional uh, predictive distribution uh, of the unobserved timestamps T. Um, and typically, um, in a lot of examples you may have seen, like in your courses, um, you can do this exactly. Um, but here we don't actually know the distribution of our unobserved timestamps. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use Monte Carlo integration um, to find a, a value of this expectation. Um, and so because we don't know P and we can't sample from P, um, what we do is we find another distribution that we can sample from um, and generate proposals of our, of our latent time. Um, from Q and then weight them against the log posterior for P using uh, important sampling and gain uh, an estimate for the expectation for Q. 
And so these weights are kind of important in understanding what the expected value is, because if we use a distribution Q that's really far away from P, a lot of these weights uh, get very close to zero and we have degeneracy um, when we try and approximate this expectation. So it's really important uh, that we find um, a distribution P that is close enough to Q that doesn't kind of damage our approximation of the expectation. And then we have a maximization step, which is at the end, which kind of just maximizes um, this Q function over all values of theta. And then again, we just iterate this um, until we have convergence in our parameter values. Um, so how do we simulate proposals? So um, at, uh, at the beginning, we just kind of use this uniform distribution to uniformly distribute time points within each bin. Um, but of course, a uniform distribution is really far away um, from P here uh, because of the Hawk structure. Um, so if the Hawk structure didn't have uh, that uh, self-exciting uh, function G, we would come back to um, a Poisson process, which has a conditional distribution of conditionally uniform distribution of points in each interval. But because of the Hawk structure um, and the existence of that self-excitation, uh, we can't use this and the, the, the distributions are actually really far. So this led to um, weights getting very close to zero and weight degeneracy. Um, and so what we what we decided to do was kind of a ha hack approach, but um, given M vents in each bin, uh, what we did was we maximized the joint density of the truncated time points in each bin. And this can be found from its joint CDF given by this form. So we just differentiate this guy to find uh, the joint truncated PDF. Um, and then new times were, were generated as those that just maximize the joint PDF um, over each interval. Um, and then we repeated this process sequentially within the um, expectation maximization or CARS EM um, to get a, a distribution that's very close to P here that led to uh, better weights and more approximate, um, a better approximation for our expectation. So our algorithm is as follows. So um, we randomly initialize parameter estimates uh, we set a threshold uh, for uh, convergence. We generate proposals by maximizing the truncated PDF. Um, we assign the weights. Uh, we then maximize the expectation um, using the scaled weights. Um, and then we update the parameter estimates. And as soon as our parameters, parameter estimates converge, um, that's when we stop the algorithm. So a short simulation study here. Uh, so given parameters new alpha and beta, uh, and some maximum simulation time, we simulated uh, realizations of the Hawk process, and then we bend it across uh, time intervals of fixed length delta. Um, and then we applied each of our methods, so the bin log likelihoods, which is the simplistic method, the NRP approximation, and our MCEM method. Um, and here are some box plots on two different studies um, for all kind of alpha, uh, uh, no, new alpha and beta parameters. And you can see our, our methods um, is really unbiased across all studies and actually does have lower variance than a lot of the other methods um, in a lot of the parameters. Um, just an application. Um, so we use this method uh, to apply it to some cybersecurity data sets. So uh, we used uh, NetFlow data from LANL and that's like a very popular um, data set which I know a lot of people are using in the cyber realm because it is open source. Um, so NetFlow is a protocol operating on routers uh, that assembles records of communication between several devices. Um, it's got a lot of potential in detecting a variety of different network activities, including uh, network intrusion detection. Um, and so what we did was we applied the methodology, um, the NetFlow data from LANL um, that uh, were collected from routers and recorded at this one second resolution. So that all the events are rounded per second. We isolated uh, communication channels, which we know uh, show kind of potential horse behavior. So here are three um, studies here. So in case one, we have network data from midnight to 8 p.m. Uh, looks kind of clustered at certain time points um, as opposed to kind of in between hours. The second case study here is really clustered around 7.30 a.m. Um, and the last case study is more um, regular in its structure, but with a few clusters. Um, so in order to kind of compare our methods um, to existing methods, which were the NRP 
uh, and the bin log likelihood, what we did was we uh, found the parameter estimates um, from each method. Um, we then uh, transformed uh, the interarrival arrival times. We can transform them um, to be unit rate uh, exponential uh, by like a transformation from the Hawks uh, to the unit Poisson. And then we uh, followed by followed on by doing cuckoo plots of the transformed uh, interarrival arrival times uh, with those from an exponential one distribution. And so this is our uh, our results on the left here, which show kind of uh, a nice comparison and agreement with uh, the exponential distribution, and then uh, the other two um, methodologies um, that were a little bit more further away from what we would expect. So concluding up this first part, um, we presented a new technique for handling aggregated or bin data um, using this new MCEM algorithm. We found it consistently has lower uh, mean squared error and lower bias and other methods, um, especially over the different kind of uh, simulation studies that we had. Um, we also kind of used it on this real cyber security data set from NANL, uh, where we found some really nice results. Um, and this, this method can be extended to, to multivariate cases, which are also useful in cybersecurity, where you have uh, multiple devices and are looking um, at multivariate data. So if, before I move on to the next case study, do we have any questions on that part? Uh, I, have a, I have a question. So you like have this bin data and you're trying to make it work with this kind of continuous XT thing. Mm -hmm. So what would, what would be wrong with just defining XT as discrete in the first place and even not to model it? Um, so the Hawks process in general is a continuous time process here. So there could be a way of maybe discretizing the Hawks process yeah. Um, I, I'm sure there are discrete horse process models out there, uh, but then you have to really think about your distributions um, between event time. So that would have to be on a discrete scale, but you can do that. Any other questions? Okay, I'll move on. Uh, so the next part of this talk um, is uh, on flexible excitation kernels. Um, so previously we saw this Hawk structure uh, with the background intensity um, and the excitation kernel coming uh, from previous event or from the impact of previous events on future events. Um, and so this is kind of going to be talking about how we can make excitation kernels uh, and the impact of previous events more flexible than um, parametrically driven models that are currently exist. So this, this uh, work was actually motivated by specific data set, um, specifically terror attacks. Um, and so we have an open, there's an open, uh, open source database of terror attacks that's out there, you can download it, uh, which gives uh, his historical uh, terror attacks across the world, um, including a lot of covariates and uh, spatial temporal stamps. Um, and so we kind of, we downloaded this data and from that we wanted to develop um, a flexible model uh, that quantifies the occurrence and analyzes the risk of extreme terror events and that's an arbitrary space-time location. And so um, we immediately kind of knew about self-excitation in the data, we could see it. And so we wanted to model uh, uh, the spatial temporal trends um, in the terror data with a, with a self-exciting spatial temporal Hawks model. But in order to analyze the risk of extreme terror attacks, we needed to understand more about the data so what we did was we defined the variable, uh, which were the number of casualties that are produced um, from each uh, terror attack. Um, and we got interested in actually modeling a marked spatial temporal intensity um, using the number of casualties produced by each attack as the mark. So this is, um, this is a non-parametric estimate of the spatial temporal intensity um, across the Asian region, which um, looks at Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Um, and the, the circles around them um, show how extreme they are. So a larger circle indicates um, that more casualties are produced from them. So it was a really one is a, a kind of flexible model um, to represent this. Um, and something in the criminal kind of literature is that um, criminal or crime activities at the city levels um, can be modeled really effectively by horse processes. Um, but we were kind of looking at country levels. So we had these different scales of self-excitation and uh, self-exciting behavior. Um, and so this really motivated the use of um, creating something really flexible um, and having flexible excitation kernel. 
Uh, so we defined a mark spatial temporal point process, XSTM, uh, for each terror attack. So S is the lat long location of the attack, T is the time, and M is the mark, or the number of casualties that are produced from that attack. And so what we did was we wrote the intensity of uh, X here by lambda. So this is the Hawks conditional intensity function at the uh, space and time location of an attack, given its history and some spatial temporal covariates, which are going to be important in this model. And then this is weighted by a probability density function of casualties or marks. Right, so we're really looking at uh, the extreme behavior of marks um, and the risk that each kind of attack has uh, on society. So how do we model the background? So uh, we're looking at this conditional intensity function of the Hawks process. Um, we write it as a gen uh, in general as a uh, kind of generic uh, background intensity and a generic uh, excitation kernel there. So with the background, what we found uh, was that um, because we had different spatial and temporal scales um, of this Hawks behavior, um, we looked at writing the background as an inhomogeneous Poisson process, uh, which takes into account uh, specific spatial temporal covariates that we can find differently in each district. So things that would be of interest in modeling terror um, are the population density in each district of that country or countries, um, specific uh, religion and ethnic groups, uh, their population um, and percentage percentages across the district. Uh, distance nearest border, uh, that was useful in kind of comparing uh, terror in regions uh, between um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Pakistan and India. So we thought that might be important. And something else that might have an effect are voting statistics um, if terror is kind of motivated by something happening politically. Um, for the triggering uh, triggering kernel here, um, to make this as flexible as possible, uh, we wrote uh, the triggering function um, as A times F squared to make it uh, um, positive, where F is a Gaussian process. Um, and I know some of you are not super familiar with, with Gaussian processes, but um, essentially this is the, uh, it's an, it's an infinite, um, it's an infinite dimensional uh, Gaussian distribution. So instead of having a huge multivariate uh, Gaussian um, over kind of discrete times and spaces, um, we make this continuous. So instead of having, you know, covariance matrix, we now have a covariance function. Instead of having a mean vector, we now have a mean function. So all these um, nice things about the Gaussian uh, distribution still holds, but we're just looking at it in functional form. And so the covariance function um, of F, which is a Gaussian process, and this kind of gives like a nice prior over um, random function, uh, we can use Mercer's expansion, which is kind of like um, an eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition buffer functions. Um, we can write it uh, as a decomposition, an uh, infinite sum of eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. And so really analogously to um, principal component analysis, we don't need infinite infinitely many eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, we can take, you know, K of them, which kind of uh, capture the, the highest amount of variance, which is in, in the same way. Um, and so given this, given Mercer's expansion, um, we write uh, F here, so this random function as omega times um, a matrix of eigenfunctions, and omega here is distributed, a Gaussian distributed with zero mean um, and covariance, which is a diagonal matrix of these eigenvalues. So some uh, examples of covariance uh, functions that are typically used in the literature um, include the squared exponentials. This is a very popular one that a lot of people use. Um, and this has a known uh, Mercer expansion with respect to the Gaussian measure, uh, the rational quadratic, which kind of limits to the squared exponential, a uh, periodic, um, which is on kind of zero one, which also has a known Mercer expansion with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Um, other covariances which are popular include the Matten. Um, but we found that not all covariance functions have known Mercer expansions, which will really kind of limit um, the way we decompose uh, the functions and this approach. Um, so to allow for full flexibility in our choice of covariance, um, we needed to incorporate a regularization term and it's kind of an extra log likelihood. Um, and so for triggering data, XJ, um, that uh, from event XI, we want to find the function that minimizes this expression here. And so because of this integral term, this comes from the, the log likelihood, um, this doesn't guarantee a solution with respect to the covariance uh, K that we just saw. So what we needed to do was construct a different kernel 
um, which obviously would be able to be computed if the covariance function has an explicit Mercer expansion. Um, and so uh, this is some work that was done by Seth Flaxman, uh, who's now at Oxford, um, previously at Imperial, but he found um, a solution F can be found using this covariance function here, which is like an updated version of our Mercer expansion, but with updated eigenvalues and updated eigenfunctions. Um, and so when Mercer's expansion is unknown, uh, we have to sample the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, so we construct, the way we do this is by um, constructing a uniform grid U, uh, evaluating its covariance function KUU, finding the K high highest eigenvalues, lambda I and eigenvectors uh, of this uh, random kind of fun uh, matrix here. We then evaluate covariance between our data and U to find KXU, and then we can compute from our data and this kind of sampling algorithm, um, the updated eigenvalues and eigenfunctions um, from this updated uh, kernel uh, covariance uh, K tilde. And then we just write F in the usual way um, where our updated omega now is from a Gaussian distribution um, with uh, covariance, uh, uh, which is diagonal um, of these new uh, eigenvalues. Um, so given this uh, representation, um, our log likelihood function takes this form. Uh, this includes kind of the representation of the uh, casualties here. Um, and so our log likelihood function given our unknown parameters um, can, is by this. Um, and so um, just as a first pass, uh, we estimated all unknown parameters using just Markov chain Monte Carlo. There's some really nice properties which I'm going to exploit in the, in the next slides, which kind of motivate the MCMC approach. And also there are some drawbacks to this too. Um, so first of all, um, going back uh, to uh, you know the Hawkes process um, formulation in general, um, in order to perform the MCMC, we need to condition on something called the Hawkes branching structure. So going back, we know an event that follows the Hawkes kernel either comes from the background or is triggered or self-excited by a previous event in its history. Um, so in order to find the structure or the branching structure of each event, uh, this essentially classifies a point, an event, as either background or uh, the point that it's been excited from. So uh, we can, so for each uh, event in our data set, uh, we can write down or compute the total intensity, you know, given all the parameters that we, we have in the MCMC um, through uh, the background uh, by just evaluating it um, and all previous events here. Uh, through the um, Gaussian process formulated excitation. Um, and so it either comes from the background with probability uh, PI naught, which is the background uh, contribution divided by LI, or is triggered by a specific event XJ from the history with probability PIJ, um, where we just use the Gaussian process formulated triggering uh, divided by the total intensity. And then we pick, so we classify each uh, data point by simply sampling from this uh, probability vector. And for each iteration, we just save out this branching structure. And you can already tell if we have a huge data set, this is gonna be really inefficient, uh, which is. Um, so how do we infer parameters of uh, the Gaussian process? Um, so we know all uh, immigrants or uh, excited or triggered points in, the, in our data set, which, and we know exactly which uh, points in our data there are from this branching structure, which we will sample in each MCMC iteration, uh, follow um, this intensity function. Um, and so we can write out uh, the um, log posterior of uh, our omegas um, and our branching structure, given the rest of uh, our parameters, um, which is given by this guy. And, and while it looks messy, um, we can actually compute first and second derivatives of this um, posterior distribution or conditional distribution, um, which really motivates the use of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, uh, where we can supply it with the first and second derivatives, um, and it will sample omega in a really kind of nice way. And so we also have this integral here, um, and so we can't we can't compute this explicitly, um, but we what we can do is. Um, just as you know, use our favorite tricks uh, with um, Monte Carlo integration, come up with an uh, um, unbiased uh, approximation to this integral with uh, Monte Carlo integration, um, which is nice because in MCMC, uh, we don't actually need to know uh, the value of the likelihood exactly. We can just plug in an unbiased estimate of the likelihood and the MCMC will converge in the usual way. Um, so this is kind of a nice um, 
nice uh, way to do that. Um, so for the rest of the parameters, so for the regression parameters of our background intensity, what we found was useful uh, was to use a normal approximation to the posterior, and this is because we had the inclusion of these covariates. And so what we did there was uh, we just maximized uh, the posterior, the log posterior, the density of um, our regression parameters given the rest of our parameters, um, and then use that as a plugin um, to uh, generate a new sample with a Gaussian kind of approximation. And here we can also find the Hessian uh, from the second derivative of the log conditional density. Um, the parameters of the covariance kernel um, is you, we use, uh, so I, in the first pass, I use Metropolis Hastings, but this isn't very efficient um, and there are, there are better ways of doing this. So moving on to some, um, like a real example here, uh, we studied Afghanistan between 2013 and 2018. Uh, we normalize time, space, and marks to be within the interval 0, 1, so we can use this uniform sampling approach. Um, we found there are long spatial scales, but short temporal scales. Um, and we also had uh, this issue with the data where it was rounded or approximated to the nearest kind of bin. So um, a lot of the temporal um, events were just rounded to the nearest day. And if we had more than one event occur on each day, we didn't know what to do, but apart from just jitter, um, the event times across that day. A lot of the attacks were also kind of approximated to the nearest city, the nearest kind of, uh, the latitude longitude of the nearest city. So we did some kind of kind of Gaussian um, jittering there of those spatial points to just to get some like uh, non-exact but different data. For the casualties, we use the generalized ZIF distribution. Um, this is a discrete analogy to the generalized Pareto distribution. And the reason for this is that we found um, the distribution of casualties obviously in turn had uh, this extremal behavior where we had some events causing huge, huge numbers of casualties, uh, but we also needed the zero inflation to account for a lot of failed events that uh, produce zero casualties. Um, and so this is kind of a nice discrete uh, distribution that we used uh, for the number of casualties. Um, so the color scheme is a bit off here, but um, for the background uh, regression parameters, things that we found useful were the number of languages spoken um, in each district of Afghanistan, and this kind of correlated with the ethnic uh, distribution. Uh, the city altitude, uh, we find um, the kind of sit the uh, district's kind of capital city, the altitude of that. Um, that affected terror. So the higher that point was in altitude, the less likely it was to be attacked. Um, obviously, population density was a huge factor in this um, across time. So um, districts or places with uh, higher populations were more likely to be attacked because there would be uh, more casualties likely to be produced from them. Something we found really interesting and potentially relates to what happened a couple of years ago in Afghanistan is um, we found voting statistics um, of the population density that voted for the opposition government in each of the um, voting years. And we found that had a huge um, contribution to our background intensity. And we think this might have something to do um, with uh, opposing governments and the Taliban um, and their kind of um, connection. So these are the results. So we fitted the model. Um, our intensity kind of changes between 2013 and 2018. It obviously gets, um, there's a, there's a higher amount of intensity in certain places. Um, and on the bottom, there are absolute residuals uh, using kind of Voronoi tessellations across um, the country. And this kind of, the accuracy gets a little better once we have more training data. Um, and then we could also predict the intensity in 2019 to 2021. Um, and this didn't have any data associated with it. So the last year we had data in Afghanistan was 2018. So we kind of just blindly run predictions for the model with no data in these years. So you can see this is getting, uh, this intensity is gradually increasing. Here's a nice kind of uh, video of how the intensity changes between um, I think 2013 and 2021. Um, and what was nice about this was that um, the formation of this ring occurred in our model, um, which you can see gets um, more prevalent in the later years. Um, but there's actually a road here. It's called the Afghanistani Ring Road, and it's the road that um, 
uh, attackers might use to kind of travel around the country and go to different districts. So it was really nice to see that this corroborated with a lot of kind of qualitative studies um, in terror in that country. So conclusion on this part, uh, we formulated a flexible spatial temporal model uh, to study terror events. Um, the inclusion of kind of the marks, so the number of casualties and the probability density also helped to quantify the risk of extreme attacks and look at more extreme uh, terror and where they would occur uh, spatially and temporally. Um, to kind of make uh, the models flexible as possible, we constructed a flexible self-excitation kernel using um, Gaussian processes as priors. Um, and we um, looked at uh, Afghanistan with some really interesting results that were also kind of corroborated uh, by uh, news articles and other studies in the region. Um, I want to acknowledge Lee, uh, who's at Securinix, Ed and Niall, Imperial College London for the cybersecurity work, uh, Danny Reese, um, who helped give some of the lightning data and then gave up work there, uh, who helped with the terrorism work. And here are some references. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Was I good on time? Uh, you're, you're perfect. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Uh, thank you, Lipton. So uh, do we have any questions for the speaker also on Zoom? Thank you. Um, have you applied this kind of big model to No, I haven't. I so a lot of the most widely reported COVID data are reported uh, just on a daily level. Number of cases. That would be really interesting because I know the SRI is really uh, a good model for the SRI is like quarks with yeah, a lot of self excitations. Yeah. That would be really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know like a number of you are studying infectious diseases. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. I kind of use them. I just reach out Okay. I mean, you're welcome to use the staff. It's on GitHub okay. if you want to. <laughs> yeah, I can point you to it. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I have a, a modeling question in the mm -hmm. second a part of the talk. Yeah. So you're using the square of a Gaussian process yeah. for, for your intensity function, um, which, I mean, it's positive, which is kind of one of the yeah. requirements of the excitation uh, function, but it's not necessarily integrable. Correct. Uh, and so, um, you know, the, in particular, that the, the construction in terms of the branching process yeah. requires the integrability, integrability yeah. of the F square. Uh, so, has that been an issue? Uh, not in the so not in the covariances. So we kind of picked a couple of simplistic covariance models where we do have that integrability. But that's a really good point if you want to extend that to more general covariance cases. Um, so maybe you, so I mean, the F squared there isn't, you can make, you can make that work, where is it? So you have G to AF squared, so it's positive, but you can do anything you want uh, to make, to make that positive. Well, function. I mean, you could just uh, do a complex support. Yeah, support of course. Yeah. yeah. So it's so a theory of solution, but I, I guess the other, <laughs> coming from my background, the other obvious question is why go with the square of a Gaussian process rather than just try to do a complex uh, parametric number. Yeah, this things. was just an idea that we had. It was just a very simple, I mean, we didn't have a lot of time with this project, so we just had to do something. Yeah. Um, this was the first idea we had, was just, you know, take the square, it's going to be positive and see what happens there. So usually if you take an exponential, you might come into issues with um, um, uh, overflow of parameters and overflow of data. So th this was something we just came up with. Yeah, but if you do, I mean, if you write the, um, uh, the excitation function as, you know, constant times a mixture of densities, yeah. so flexible enough, you're going to- That's a good uh, idea. That's a really good idea. Actually, computationally, it's easier. Okay. So if you try to do the uh, this version of the MCMC that uses the branching structure, is pretty straightforward. Okay, uh, yeah. To do the, uh, so, so the, you, you're not doing that in practice. You're doing the Hamiltonian. So yeah, we're doing Hamiltonian. That, yeah, maybe a little bit, but I think it's a still completely more practical. Okay, nice. Um, yeah, I'll take a look into that. Thank you. Yes. Which which details? There's a part where updating the Parameters this one. Oh, yeah. This is just a we. I basically ran out of time, so I just did this like in a really inefficient way. 
Um, usually with GPs, the best way to actually do this, I found, um, what you want to do is you want to train um, a variation of autoencoder that can spit out uh, realizations of Gaussian process really quickly and then uh, feed that into MCMC. And that's going to really help things get more efficient. Um, so if you're like looking at that, I would definitely don't do this. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm trying similar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just don't do it. It's, it's, it's really messy. It's not clean. It takes ages. Um, really inefficient. Yeah. 